Blah freaking blah. What's going on, guys? This is Eric. Blah freaking blah. Thank you for joining me. Uh, we are past 300 subscribers now. 300 strong. Yes. It's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for listening. Thank you for commenting and liking videos. All of that helps um, strengthen the channel, and it helps carry the conversation on. And boy, do I have one to start with today. Um, so we're having a proper podcast today. We are going to have a full-length proper podcast, and I'm going to look through this pile of things that I have to talk about. And I'm going to start off with one that I don't really want to share, but I'm kind of having to backtrack a recommendation that I've made to you guys, and it is on IDW comic books Transformers series. Now I'm a I've I've talked up the series. Sorry, moving the microphone for a second. I've talked up this series a couple of times in videos um, because at the point where I left off on it, it was one of the smartest, well-written, laugh out loud, funny books um, that I was reading, and I was very excited. I mean, it was just being done so well. I mean. It wasn't perfect. I mean, sometimes the dialogue was kind of static where everybody talked the same, but the writing was so witty and so well done that that was easily forgivable, at least to me. And IDW had a pretty steady uh, sales record on it. And, uh, you know, I mean, it was selling. The attrition on the book was very, very low, and that's so unusual, especially nowadays. You know, they were getting up to the issues 20 and 30 and 40, and it was it was holding steady with slight attrition, um, but it was right around the 10,000 copy mark. It was just plugging along, doing just fine. Well, when I started talking about it the other day, um, well, a few weeks back, I say the other day, uh, in reg and especially in regard to um, the latest Transformers film, Bombing, I mean, bombing hard, uh, <clears throat> I looked at Comicron, that's the website that I recommend to you guys to look for if you want to check the sales numbers each month on your own. Um, Comicron.com uh, aggregates the numbers from Diamond Distributors. If we had a, if we had more than one distributor, it might be harder for them to aggregate the numbers, but, you know, we don't. We ought to, but we don't. But I'm not going to go there. And I looked at the numbers the past few months for the Transformers series, and they were, man, they have, I mean, they're, barely trudging 6,000 copies out. And I was like, man, what? They've lost 50%? What happened? <sighs> so, then I see this. Uh, and I realize why they've been losing all their readers. So, but before I get into this, I found an article... That is that was two years previous to this that I you know I com I completely missed, and I want to go to this one first before I jump to this one because it kind of follows a line of thought, and it's a disturbing line of thought, and I'm gonna have to read this off my phone because I can't for some reason I can't bring it up on the computer. Who knows? Maybe my computer is just rebelling against the nonsense, like lots of us. Um. So yes, we have gay and transgender. Transformers. Because why not, right? Makes It makes perfect sense. <coughs> so this first article is from The Guardian. And I warn you now, I, the article I'm going to be reading through, this article, this writer, uh, is just lavishly just speaking praise over this decision, just loving every second of it, just breathless, breathless. Um... Over this choice, and the title, if you want to look this up, and I should have a link in the description box below, but uh, the t God, God help me. This is going to be one of, I'm going to have to really trudge through this one. Kiss Me, Chrome Dome, How the Transformers Found Peace and Same-Sex Partnerships. Oh. A spinoff comic has shapeshifted the smash em up Transformers robots into a world of same-sex partnerships and a leader modeled on Tony Benn. Okay, um... Boy. Okay. We're just going to trudge through this one, okay? Michael Bay was in Oxfordshire recently to shoot The Last Night, the final installment of the Mighty Transformers franchise. Well, that already is wrong. It's the final installment he's doing, 
But of course, given the box office numbers, maybe they were being accidentally prophetic while misspelling installment. The maker of the highest grossing movie of 2014, Transformers Age of Extinction, which took over $1 billion, was up to his old trick stomping on British sensibilities by converting beautiful Ballenheim Palace into a Nazi headquarters. See, th- th- okay, this writer just... <laughs> Stomping on British sensibilities by addressing something that happened in history. The SJW movement is so thin-skinned, they can't even address history without getting prickly. But I digress, moving on. This may take me a minute to get through, but we're going to just hang here with me. But in another wing of the franchise, I promise I'm going to suck it up and just get through this. The the shape-changing robots have been venturing into much less likely territory, exploring such weighty issues as social mobility personal identity, and various corrosive ideologies, while also establishing the world of Transformers as a homonormative society. Fans of Chrome Dome and Rewind may be touched to learn that the two are now in a romantic relationship. Now, bear in mind, this article was written in... It was written on December 2nd, 2016. The sales have been plummeting. Plummeting, and they say, oh, it's just going so great. Just wait. Launched in 2012, the comic book series Transformers More Than Meets the Eye tells the story of a group of robots journeying across the universe on a quest to find the mythical Knights of Cybertron, who may or may not all be gay. The original children of Primus and the other four gods of the... That was... I added that in. Of the Guiding Hand, in case you didn't know, the series is written by... Hmm... Gersney-based, I'm just going to call it Gersney, James Roberts, whose background is in the civil service. <clears throat> but, such is the churn of the comics industry. The title was wound down in September at issue 57, the plan being to relaunch it this month as Transformers Lost Light. Yeah, I'd say the light has been lost. Again, that was me. Sorry, I hope you guys can distinguish when I'm throwing in little snippets of sarcasm. The hope is to create a jumping on point for new readers. Though Robert's radical take on the 30-year-old toy brand will continue apace. I always wanted to give the franchise as much depth and weight as possible. I'm pretty sure this isn't what he sounds like, but it's just what I'm going with. One of the easiest way to do it, to do that, is to politicize it. Let me let me read that again in my normal voice. I always wanted to give the franchise as much depth and weight as possible. One of the easiest ways to do that is to politicize it. I'm sorry, I just, I'm going to, I'm beating my, I'm just going to beat my head into the desk for a second, okay? One of the, okay, do you guys see how this is already going badly? That this writer thinks you should politicize a comic book based on toys. Now, I'll get to the good parts and the bad parts of this in a second, but I'm going to go on. As a fan of the clunky robots since childhood, and that seems to actually be true, Roberts has always had a sense of entitlement when it comes to messing with their core concept, specifically the act of transformation. And more than meets the eye, I explored the idea that millions of years ago, the Transformers existed in a system with a functionalist doctrine, meaning the thing you turn into determines your status. The more commonplace the device you became, the fewer privilege you had. And I will confess that about the time he started introducing that, I st- my red flag started going up. And I've lost the article to a pop-up ad. Pop-up ads are the bane of mobile internet use is existence. If you, if you run a website, please don't do the full-page pop-up ad for mobile devices. It's just, God, it sucks so bad. So going on. In a move that, doubt, that would doubtless intrigue Bay, Roberts brought in the concept of municipal eugenics. A type of transformer could literally be made redundant because there's no longer a use for its newly shifted shape. Maybe, says Roberts, there's an analogy here in terms of how disabled people are treated in some quarters by government. If they're not producing, they're not making the necessary contributions to society, and so they, they're devalued. Okay. Make a note of what he just talked about. That's basically what the Nazis did. Socialist party Nazis. Roberts has even dared to rehabilitate the classic Transformers boogeyman Megatron, 
going back to his early days and depicting him as a young radical. Originally, Megatron was an incredible thinker who advocated nonviolent resistance you know, while he beat people to death in an arena. That's fine. He was in the Tony Benn mold, an international socialist. <clears throat> you see how the SJW here has already conflicted with himself? He campaigned for emancipation and equality, but eventually concluded the system had been engineered to withstand any form of dissent other than force. As is the case with grand tragedies, he traveled away from the goals he had in the beginning and walked the well-trodden path from communism to totalitarianism. Now, let me tell you there's something, John. With communism, there is no other way to get to power. It always leads to totalitarianism. And the socialists are responsible for the people not pouring into society, not pulling their weight, and they disappear and they vanish. That's the whole, the, the whole structure of the, of the political system is everybody has to put in their fair share. Anyway, digressing, moving on. But Megatron's journey didn't stop there. Recent issues saw him teaming up with the Autobots, against whom he had waged a four million year war. He's been tested says Roberts of the one-time leader of the villainous Decepticons, able to change into three different types of gun. And now, he's renounced violence. <clears throat> so you see here, while that was intriguing, and I kind of was following along to see what they were going to do, and I, I backed off just as they were getting to this point, <clears throat> um, I never got into this any further, so I don't know how it turned out. To me, this sounds like the moral relativism Good guys are bad, bad guys are good. It all depends on your perspective, your point of view. Some may doubt the Transformers concept can bear such weight, but Roberts believes the line's longevity and the success of the Bay movies have encouraged Hasbro to give him his head. You know, here in America, we use different terminology. It's a mature franchise, and it's doing very well in various iterations. That's true. So Transformers can encompass different types of stories in the same way a property like Batman does. <laughs> okay, just keep telling yourself that, John. Surprisingly, perhaps, one strand of the story has met no resistance. This is the writer here. No resistance. The portrayal of same-sex relationships as the norm for this robot society. When they were created, Transformers were exclusively male. They used the male pronoun, and in the 1980s cartoon series, they had male voices. I wanted to tell romantic stories. If two characters were in a relationship, the probability was that they were going to be men. Step forward, Chrome Dome and Rewind, both from the original toy line. They were close, says Roberts. You could have read it as them being best friends, which I did at the time. Had there been any pushback, that's how it would have stayed. But about a year into the series, I became more overt, depicting them as essentially husbands, giving them a storyline where the emotional high point was one, one saying to the other, I love you. Yes, because men, brotherhood, they, they never say I love you to each other. That just doesn't happen. You know, Frodo and Samwise, that wasn't a brotherhood. I, mm, <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting a little choked up on this. Let me grab a sip of coffee. Wait, wait there. Okay, that's better. <coughs> Sorry. I'm going to leave that in. I'm not even going to cut that out. It wasn't a big deal to them or those around them. There's never been any scene, nor will they be, where other Transformers remark about them upon them being together. Because you know, the reason why is SJWs have to write this as normal. They always have to write it. There's never a problem with it. Nonetheless, says Roberts, it felt like a big deal to me. So much so that he drafted a letter to Hasbro justifying its inclusion. But there was no opposition, despite the current polarization in comics between a loud conservative sector of the readership and the so-called social justice warriors promoting a more liberal ideology. In October, Marvel writer... Chelsea Kane quit Twitter following harassment about her decision to depict S.H.I.E.L.D. agent Mockingbird in a t-shirt bearing the slogan, Ask Me About My Feminist Agenda. The fuss left Roberts staggered. People say there's no place for politics in comics, but comics have been political from the start. 
If you don't think X-Men has been telling a story about marginalization and ostracization for the past 50 years, you've been reading a different title to me. His work seems to be going a lot further than t-shirt slogans. Does he ever worry it will catch fire in a similar way? I do, but anything that spe sparks bigger conversation about progressive politics is good. I will agree with that one comment, that people talking about it and exposing it is good. And the reason why SJWs just don't seem to get it is morals and issues of the human heart and good versus evil aren't freaking political issues. The reason why they do this, as a general rule, is they worship government. They worship government. Everything has to come from government. They turn to government for everything to solve every problem. There is no God in the equation. They are all, and, and that's why they, they moralize. Everything is political. Everything. Progressive politics is good. Congratulations, IDW. You have infected the Transformers line with SJW politics. Now, you think that's where it ends? No. Let's get to the current news. July 27, 2017. This coming courtesy of BleedingCool.com. Holy God, we're 15 minutes in. All right. Transformers Lost Light number 8 features trans women Transformers. I am not kidding. So this article states, It wasn't that long ago that all Transformers were, de facto, were referred to as male. God, these guys really need to proofread their articles. Hasbro decided that they were boys' toys. It's because they were boys' toys. God! And so there was no room for female robots. But boys eventually grew up, some of them, in later iterations that changed... In later iterations, that changed. And female Transformers... Trom tra <sighs> Jeez, I'm all stammering now. And female Transformers characters emerged. They were initially seen as aberrations, but eventually gained a presence, albeit a minority one, within the Transformers universe of comics, toys, cartoons, and movies. They were slightly more than Smurfettes. <clears throat> and of late, we have... We have has trans... Bleeding cool, come on. We have had trans and non-binary Transformers as well. Transformers Lost Light by James Roberts and Jack Lawrence has been a pioneer in the way Transformers have portrayed themselves regarding gender and romantic interest. Hence this week's issue with art by Priscilla Tremontano and Joanna Lafuente featuring Transformers Anode and Lug talking about their expressed designations their expressed designations. In previous issues, they had been presented as a male or gender-neutral couple. Mm. Oh. And then they go through this conversation where they explain why, hey, this person is not a he anymore, they're a she, and blah de blah blah de blah blah de blah blah de blah I'll put the link to this article in the description box as well if you want to see the panels, if you want to read this for yourself. It's... You probably should read this for yourself. And then <clears throat> Bleeding Cool goes on to gushingly say, It's what happens when you step out into the big wide world and the possibilities available to you expand exponentially. <coughs> uh, and then, so they, they go through the whole conversation and it's like, Oh, it's normal, it's fine. And, uh, yeah, so... We now have Transformers who are gay and Transformers who are changing their sexual designations. They are robots. They are robots who are forged. You have written this in your own series. They are not created the same way we are. They do not procreate the same way we do. They are not sexual beings. You are apparently too much because you are inserting sexual identity into robots. Aimed at children. Now, I am a grown man, and I enjoy reading the Transformers. It's because when I was a kid, I liked it, and I'm the same person. I like it, I like it, I like it. And I am just enormously disappointed with IDW. I'm enormously disappointed with this decision that they've done. And they stick their head so far up there behind that they lick their esophagus in thinking, it's, it's fine. 
The sales numbers aren't reflective of people rejecting this idea. No, 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 it's fine. Let's just keep doubling down and tripling down. That will help increase sales. Congratulations, IDW. You are doing it the Marvel way. <sighs> I need to move on to something else. I cannot believe I'm already about, what are we, 20 minutes in now? I have, I'll tell you what, guys. Just post your comments down below um, what you think of this. I, I hey, I'll, I'll never... I'm I'm not <sighs> They're Transformers, guys. They're goddamn Transformers. <sighs> okay. So got that out of the way. I'm sorry for suggesting the book. Um, you know, like I said, if that is your thing, if that is what you're looking for, then clearly you will <laughs> respond to this news in an opposite manner that I did. Great, now you know. Go buy the book, enjoy the book. It is everything you want it to be. I, myself, personally, will not. What do we got next? What are we going to get into next? Hmm. You know what? Let's do this, because this is a follow-up of the uh, video I just put out about DC taking the crown from Marvel, potentially. And <clears throat> I had a couple of people make, leaving snide comments um, here and there about, you know... Uh, I'll never buy a DC book ever. There was one guy in particular clearly didn't bother to even. He just he just hate clicked. He hate commented on the uh, title alone. But I found a better article that kind of goes into this, and I want to I want to dig into this. This is for, actually from Movie Pilot, ironically. Um, <clears throat> so this quote that Jim Lee may or may not have said started the conversation, and noting that maybe Jim Lee didn't say it, that's kind of what he's hinting at on Twitter, at least the last that I've seen. We have to stop the collapse of the comic book industry. Uh, this article is called DC Comics says the comic book industry is on the brink of collapse and they have a plan to save it. Now, <clears throat> on its face, that seems like a kind of arrogant thing to say. It, you know, it's, it's, it's almost Marvel at its height of, uh, of arrogance right now. But there seems to be something going on with the comic book uh, insiders, the comic book industry insiders. They're trying to, I mean, fans, it's all over the internet. We're all concerned about the industry. And they're like, no, no, nothing to see here. It's fine. And even when he, even when this quote is attributed to them, I see a lot of backtracking. And I didn't say this. And, you know, anyway, but the article goes on to say it's since been hotly debated with other reports attributing the quote to Lee's fellow publisher, Dan Didio. Whoever said it, though, the quote is deeply disturbing. So, I mean, it's true. The quote, it, it needs to be said. So the article says the comic book market isn't in good shape. Sales are dropping and market leader Marvel is repeating short-term sales strategies that caused the 90s comic book bubble to burst. Mm-hmm. Now they're preaching. Flagging comic book sales are at the heart of the paradox of San Diego Comic-Con 2017. Superheroes have, been, have never been more popular and yet the comic book industry is in trouble. We can fix it. It can be fixed. <coughs> Unusually... DC Comics publishers Jim Lee and Dan Didio were absolutely open about the challenges they faced with today. See, I'm, there's conflicting reports about this. I guess they did. I I wasn't there, so I haven't seen this. If you guys uh, know of any place on YouTube, or maybe I'll do, I'll do a search later try to find it. But if you have a video that, of this conversation, uh, uh, put it in the comments section for me and for anybody else who wants to look at it. Um, I'll pin it to the top if any of you guys can find find something that's like good and, and you can actually hear the audio. They also talked at length about just how they aim to turn the market around. The success of DC Rebirth. Spearheaded by Jeff Johns, the DC Rebirth initiative has been a tremendous success. Didio openly admitted that while the company's previous New 52 relaunch had allowed them to re-examine characters and try new things, they realized that something had been lost along the way. Ah, yes, indeed. Although sales are beginning to falter a little, the fact that they're still strong a full year into the two-year arc is impressive. What's more, SDCC has seen DC Comics, way too many SDCCCs, DCs, up the ante, revealing details of Jeff John's Doomsday Clock event, as teased all the way back in last year's DC Universe Rebirth number 1. This will bring the characters of Alan Moore's Watchmen into contact with the main DC Universe. Speaking, I'm surprised, side note, I'm surprised that took that long. Everybody is just marveling at this being done. I'm like, I would have expected this to have been done in the 90s when the gimmick was the thing. 
but I guess the Watchmen was still too. I don't know. I don't know. I, I like I said, I'm I'm shocked that it took this long. Speaking at another panel, Jeff Johns teased that he'll be bringing Lex Luthor and uh, <coughs> Ozzy Mandis. Uh, Ozzy Mandius. Forgive me. Uh, he's on the crazy train. The smartest men in their respective comic book universes face to face. He has also confirmed the long-standing fan theory that Dr. Manhattan is the force behind Rebirth. As comic book fans noted when John's DC Universe Rebirth was first published, the whole arc is in part a repudiation of everything comics has been doing for the last couple of decades. It rejects the pessimism and darkness that was in vogue in the aftermath of Alan Moore's Watchmen and positioning the characters of Watchmen as the villains who've stolen life and hope from the DC Universe is a glorious meta-narrative. More and more reasons for me to get on board with DC, I got to admit. I'm so glad that people have finally, finally caught on to this. And you know what? I think it's because of the movies. I think that's where everybody realized it. Everybody's trying to go darker. And I'm like, you can't do that with everything. It only works for certain properties. The comic book industry is in a strange place. As Didio noted, comic books have become the second or third way to meet characters like Batman and Superman, and we want to change that. Thank God. That's going to mean increasing increasing the profile of the comics, focusing in on marketing and changing strategies. DC isn't content to just coast off the back of their box office success. They want the comic book publisher to stand on its own two feet. (laughs) As a result, DC is shifting its focus. Lee talked about the importance of what he called the evergreen stories, the tales that never grow old like Alan Moore's Watchmen and Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns, which are both the dark ones, but the challenge facing DC is a simple one. How can they make the next generation of evergreen stories that don't require in-depth knowledge of superhero continuity, but that stand the test of time and transform the genre? Part of it is getting key writers on board. The one and only, the, the only one Lee named in the panel was Neil Gaiman. Lee explained that they want to give their creators a challenge to tell the best Superman story, the best Batman story, the best Justice League story. It, can you can, See, we've been through this before, but it just bears repeating. It dovetails perfectly with comments uh, legendary Batman writer Scott Snyder has been making in recent months. He's been talking about stepping aside from All-Star Batman in order to participate in a new venture one DC clearly hopes will transform the market. This is Scott Snyder. DC approached me and said, how would you like to take some of the stuff that you were working on with Sean Murphy and do it in a new prestige format? Instead of doing it monthly, why not do it in this format that would allow for it to be bigger stage, both for Sean artistically and to package the story in a new way and then allow every subsequent story that I was going to do with Paul Pope uh, with Afua, A-F-U-A. Anybody know how to pronounce that? With Lee Bermejo be done in this format that really uh, foregrounds the art. Different paper size, different cut, the whole thing. And that way, it seemed obvious and a perfect solution instead of having them work month to month on a normal size conventional comic, uh, we could be some of the first people to try diving in this new lane for DC. I'm really, really thrilled about it. Eh, we'll see. I'm I'm, I'm one of those, I'll wait and see on this one. Didio describes this as a mature reader's line. You, You don't have vertigo anymore? One inspired by graphic novels that allow the art to breathe. This appears to be European-style albums, closer to three issues worth of material rather than just the one at a time. Uh, These will get into the bookstores faster than your typical graphic novels, helping with cash flow and presenting a real alternative to the direct market. Newsprint, baby! But anyway, if they're thinking outside the box, that's good. You know, some of these ideas are going to stick. So this next part of the article says, take a deep breath, a different approach to diversity and a growing emphasis on artists. (gasps) See, you could almost, any any of you guys want to start a comic company, I mean, you could literally, I think you could literally, because it seems what DC is doing, look at what Marvel is doing, write it all down, and then do the opposite. Seriously. Seriously, because this is what they're doing. Everything that Marvel's doing, for the most part, DC is doing the opposite, and it's succeeding. Marvel is actually so bad at this right now, you can, I just, money on the table, you could start a comic company, 
and you could succeed in it just by doing the opposite of what Marvel does. So the article goes on to say, since April this year, DC has been teasing the importance of a new line <coughs> that they call Dark Matter. Introducing a whole swath of new characters and featuring top talent like Jim Lee, John Romita Jr., Greg Capullo, and Andy Kubert, the line will focus on as much on the artists as on the writers. The last few years of seeing comic book writers essentially become celebrities, while artists remain seemingly undervalued. In contrast, Didio stressed that the partnership between the writer and the artist will be key to the success of Dark Matter. He's got a point. Comics are a visual medium, after all, which we've said on this channel, you and I, in the comments and in the videos. The goal of Dark Matter <clears throat> will be to improve the diversity of the DC Universe without altering the classic characters. <gasps> dun, 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 dun. You know, if Marvel really wants to succeed, fire the dudes up top and say, copy what DC is doing right now. They've got their heads clear and they're going forward. Just follow them. It's clearly a very different approach to the one taken by Marvel, whose legacy heroes have become pretty controversial among comic book fans. Uh huh. The creative teams are working to recapture the energy of the early years of Marvel. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Or the launch of Image Comics, which is a great example. Though Image arguably focused too much on the art and not enough on the story. They want Dark Matter to be fresh and exciting. And I'm, I'm literally reading about it, reading what they want to do and their vision behind it, and I'm excited about it. Lee, who kicks the line off working alongside James Tynion, T-Y-N-I-O-N, the fourth, on The Immortal Men, described the thrill of creating whole new characters and ideas. As Didio noted, they don't want to be a cover band that just plays the same old hits all the time. The panel gave tantalizing hints that Dark Matter will see DC embrace a different retail model in some way, too. Didio called 2018 a transformative year and expressed a hope that the, that the publisher will reach beyond the traditional direct market. Ooh. While Didio and Lee didn't explain any details, maybe we know, they made it clear that they aim to increase the number of new comic book fans and will be watching with fascination to see what approaches DC take. Yes, we will. I swear, is DC watching this channel, listening to me, and listening to you guys? No, but it'd be really cool if they were. Retailers will breathe a, breathe a sigh of relief. DC is avoiding a lot of the gimmicks that created a temporary sales boost but seem to be damaging the in industry. Take, for example, one of the most common. For every first issue to be supported by a wide range of variant covers, many of which have different prices to indicate their rarity. Oh, yeah, that's annoying. While these are loved by collectors, they typically lead to the next issue sales dropping like a stone. Worse still, DC has noted that the inflated prices actually drive casual fans away. I mean, seriously, they, they get it. As a result, the publisher is literally not going to do any variants in support of the new Dark Matter line. Oh, another one! <laughs> oh! As Didio noted, all we do... With that is put obstacles in the way of you buying comic books, raising prices, variant covers. We have got to stop. We can't afford this to be a dying business. Amen. While I'm sure DC will continue to use some gimmicks, their lenticular variants for the button were a tremendous success after all. They're clearly aware of the risks of going overboard. Uh, they really ought to look at their Dark Knight 3 release. Mm, they've not quite gotten away from that yet, but I digress. Some of those versions were really cool. This stands in marked contrast to Marvel, who noted the success of those lenticular variants and recently announced that their entire Marvel Legacy range later in this year will feature them. And that's about all they're going to feature. We're seeing DC and Marvel part ways, not just on pricing, but also on the use of gimmicks. It's going to be very interesting indeed to see how the industry reacts. Meanwhile, although the publisher can't afford to put all books back to the $2.99 price, they're pricing carefully. The Dark Matter, the Dark Matter books will all be cheaper than the normal titles, while some of the Dark Knight's metal books will also be at a lower price point. The last year has seen DC reverse years of decline, leaving their biggest rival Marvel struggling to catch up. I, I don't think Marvel knows which direction is up right now. Still, the comic book industry as a whole isn't in a good place right now. 
Marvel has taken one approach with their Marvel Legacy range. They're appealing to nostalgia, indulging in all the traditional gimmicks, and desperately attempting a Back to Basics meat and potatoes relaunch. If only that's what they were doing. And it isn't. That's why it's not going to work. Unfortunately, as long as... <clears throat> excuse me. Unfortunately, as long-term comic book fans will know, those are the very strategies Marvel employed in the 90s, and the comic book industry crashed. In contrast, while they're also stripping things back, DC seems to be taking a fresh approach. They're attempting to expand their range, to reach out to new markets, and to redefine the industry in a way that could well make a difference. Comic book fans all over the world can only wish them success. And then a poll at the bottom, are you excited for Dark Matter? I click yes. Well, guys, let me know in the comment section what you think about this. That was a much better article than the one I previously featured in the last video. And if this is news to you, tell me what you think about it. Uh, are you excited like I am to see at least somebody acknowledging these problems and doing something about it? You know, post your comments down below. Let me know what you're excited about, what you're not excited about. Um, yeah, thoughts are welcome. How far into this are we? We are 36 minutes in. Hell, we are rolling. Let's see what we have next. You know what? What are we going to get into next? Oh. Well, so I started this podcast off with meh. And then I went with something happy. So let's let's go ahead and just flip the coin again and go with meh. This, according to amctheaters.com, actually. I stumbled across this when looking up the uh, uh, see if Terminator 2 in 3D is coming out near me next month. By the way, Terminator 2 is coming out in 3D next month. The conversion was overseen by James Cameron, so it ought not suck. I am I I whether or not you care about 3D, seeing Terminator 2 in the theater, which I did like 5 times when I was a kid, um is well worth the price of admission. Go see it if it's near you. This article, we may have a new Captain America. And this is for the MCU. This is for the movies. This is what I've been talking about coming for a while now. Okay. In a feat more cruel than anything that Thanos could ever dream up, Marvel Studios assembled footage of Avengers Infinity War at the D23 conference but has refused to share it online yet. And I'm going to note, don't watch the crappy leaks. It, I mean, I can understand the temptation. I've done it. But God, it's so underwhelming to watch it like that. Just, just take a breath. And wait for the official release. Watch it in high definition. Watch it with good sound. Watch it where people aren't cheering in the crowd to a point you can't hear anything. Yes, there's a lot of energy there. That's the point. But, you know, I, I don't do it. I don't recommend anybody do it. It just diminishes the experience to me. Fortunately, we don't need the power of the Infinity Stones to tell you what Disney revealed, as descriptions of what happened have already surfaced online. Among the details revealed, which I have not read except for this article... D23 attendees have confirmed a long-standing rumor about Captain America's involvement in Marvel's biggest movie yet, Captain No More. While it's still unclear whether or not Steve Rogers will survive the Mad Titan's bid for power, thank you, Mark Ruffalo. I, I call crap on that, honestly, because, um, what's his name? Oh, I'm doing the diversity in comics thing where I can't think of anybody's name. <laughs> Um, sorry, seriously, I, I have that problem a lot too when I'm reading something and trying to side note. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch and the kid that plays Spider-Man, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name. They have kind of pulled a similar thing where he was going to spoil something and Benedict Cumberbatch, like, you know, uh, distracted him. I think they're trolling the fans, honestly. Uh, so I don't think everybody's going to die, but it's, it, it's just, a. I think they're just messing with us. It now seems like he'll ditch his star-spangled garb and fight the good fight with a snazzy new outfit and beard. Hmm. The reason for this spins out of Captain America Civil War, where Steve, uh, um, where Steve Rogers was last seen hiding out in Wakanda following his clash with Iron Man over the Sokovia Accords. Sorry, the reflex I just had was over the comic book, not over the uh, movie. I quite enjoyed the movie. In the comics, a similar plot line led Captain America to adopt a new su superhero identity called Nomad for a few issues, complete with a different costume. Screen Rat have suggested that the MCU version of Rogers may develop into a new version of Nomad. What do you guys think about that? Y'all like that? Mm -hmm. 
I, n- I never really read Nomad, uh, but it sounds intriguing, which means that someone else may take his place as Captain America. The Russo brothers basically confirmed this transformation a while back during an interview with the Huffington Post, explaining that the moment uh, when Cap dropped his shield in Civil War it symbolized him letting go of that identity. <clears throat> they quote, it's, a, it's him admitting that certainly the identity of Captain America was in conflict with a very personal choice that he was making. However, this is the first time that Steve's retirement from the role has been officially revealed, leaving us with one question on our minds. Who will become the new Captain America? If they don't just hand it back to this guy. <clears throat> Over the years, a number of heroes have taken Steve Rogers' place as Captain America, whether it's because he's lost his powers or been revealed as a crazed Hydra agent. <clears throat> If Cap does embrace the new persona persona of Nomad or dies in the fight against Thanos, then there are a few likely suspects who could take up the shield. In many ways, Cap's childhood friend Bucky Barnes seemed to be the most obvious candidate. Yes. Not only did the Winter Soldier take over when Rogers died in the aftermath of Civil War in the comics, but he's also ripe and ready for a classic redemption story. Yes. Yes, he is. Seen by the world as a murderous assassin, Barnes would do whatever it takes to honor the memory of his friend's legacy, all while distancing himself from his dark past as the Winter Soldier in the process. And that would, that would actually leave the story open for the uh, conflict that comes from perceptions, too. Like, isn't this the guy and he, that, that him having to live up to the mantle of Captain America and prove himself? I mean, that'd just be, it's really ripe for good storytelling. The two even share the same abilities. Dun, da, da, da. I don't know why this isn't obvious to a lot of people. There was a lot of people offended by my notion that I didn't understand Falcon taking up the mantle. And it's cool if you are. And it's cool if you like him. You know, it's, the thing about disagreements is they're just that. I'm not judging anyone for liking something that I don't or vice versa. If you dig it, dig it. I don't agree with it. I mean, I'm, I can see it in certain, like I said, capacities I've said before. Um, but as a match, like a, you know, uh, both personality wise and definitely strength and ability wise, I don't see, uh, the Falcon being a great Captain America, <clears throat> but it's not to say the character is bad. It's just fitting that mantle. Um, so it says the two even share the same abilities and actually mirror each other far more than either of either one of them realizes. I mean, they grew up together. They have the same dispositions. I mean, there's so many reasons why it works better, in my opinion. Failing that, there's also the possibility that Sam Wilson could become the Star-Spangled Avenger. Sure, Steve's other bestie is currently fighting as the Falcon, but Wilson recently took over the mantle in the comics. Oh, they use my word. And such a decision would help diversify the MCU further. Marvel Studios have come under fire more than once for a lack of representation. (sighs) Mm Mm-hmm. From the SJW crowd, who is never happy. Take Doctor Who, for instance. They made Doctor Who a woman. And as far as I understand, I quit watching Doctor Who when I was a kid. And I've not really watched too much of the new shows, though I've heard they're really good. Um, I've heard in the canon that it was always possible he could become a woman. So, big shrug. Okay, they're trying it. That's fine. And it was in response to this group. More representation. And literally, within hours of the announcement that Doctor Who was a woman, (laughs) there were people cropping up going, but the woman's not black or transgender. It's not enough. There's never pleasing this group of people, ever. Don't do it. Don't kowtow to it. You make your characters as you want to make them. Let them pass or fail on their own merits. Digressing. Marvel Studios have come under fire more than once for a lack of representation. God, clearly they don't read the frickin' books. All right, I'm, I'm going to move on. So promoting Anthony Mackie to the forefront of the Avengers as Captain America would certainly be a progressive move on their part. Mm. As a political title, I suppose. But as an actual, as an actual progress, it's regressive to me. Because it's just backwards thinking. The issue here, of course, is that Falcon is already a celebrated hero in his own right. Ta-da! And Marvel may be keen to continue developing that side of his character first. Exactly. 
exactly right. This. This right here. This right here. Falcon is doing the representing already. He's a good character. He has strengths. He is being fleshed out. Let the character flourish. <sighs> Moving on. However, both of these options could be rather telegraphed for anyone who holds even a passing knowledge of the source material. With that in mind, Marvel may turn completely left field and surprise fans by casting a woman in the role. <laughs> Black Widow was apparently seen sporting a new blonde hairstyle in the D23 footage, but we doubt that she would replace Steve in the role of Captain America. Even though it's about time that the spotlight was thrown her way. I mean, I'd go see a Black Widow movie. I won't lie. I would go see one. But am I clamoring for one? I mean, not really. Are you guys? Are any of you listening to this? Are you guys clamoring for a Black Widow story? I mean, do you think there's a story to be told? I mean, let me know. Let me know what you think. I mean, maybe as, maybe as a more modestly budgeted film that was more personal? I don't know. I mean, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I'd see it. Yeah, I'd see it. Yeah, bring it on. Instead, there's an extremely slim outside chance that Cap's love interest, Sharon Carter, could take his place. No. Despite a lack of precedent for this in the comics. Her training as an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. certainly puts Carter in good stead for such a move. It would be irony. And if Marvel ever did consider this option, then we're sure that Tony Stark could somehow... So we're going to ignore that. That's crap. Chris Evans' contract may end soon, which means that our days of oogling his superhuman six-pack may end with it. I always thought he had pretty big shoulders, actually. Like superhuman shoulders. He worked on push-ups a lot. At the end of the day, though, Steve Rogers is technically an OAP. Uh, so let's hope that Marvel <clears throat> give him the time to collect a bus pass and enjoy his twilight years without being ripped apart by Thanos. Either way, Spider-Man Homecoming revealed that Stark has created a new shield for Captain America. I haven't seen that yet. And so that's a spoiler for me. And forgive me if that's a spoiler for you. But yeah, there it is. So someone will have to step up and wield it in the upcoming war. Just maybe not Steve. Or maybe it's Steve. Maybe Steve's just in hiding for a little while. For God's sake. And he had a beard while hiding out. He gets the call. He comes back. He shaves his face. He puts in the outfit. Da, 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 he's fighting. So... The reason why I shared this article, even though as it gets to the bottom of it, it's just blatantly clickbait stuff, um, is to say the it, the idea, I, what I personally think, you know, it's addressing the question that's out there right now, is what I personally think is um, he will be nomad at the beginning of the film, he will take back up the mantle, um, and he will be Captain America. And I, that that's that's my money on the table. That's what I think. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below, which way you think this will play. Uh, what would you like to see? You know, would you like to see Bucky, Falcon, Black Widow, Carter? I mean, or, or, imagine this. If the character passes away in the films, let the character pass away. It's an amazing thought, right? If If Captain America dies, there's no Captain America. Nobody puts on the outfit. Each character is their own hero. Each one has their own identity. Why does anyone need to put the outfit on to begin with? <laughs> Post your comments down below. Let me know if you think I'm right or wrong. What do you think about that? Um, I personally think let the characters be, each of the characters be their own characters. Stop the, stop the outfit swapping. Marvel Comics needs to stop it. The Marvel films don't need to do it. All right. Let's get into, let's get, let's get into one more. How far are we? We are getting near an hour. Heck yes. <clears throat> what are we going to get into next? What do you guys want to get into? You know what? Let's talk about Zack Snyder. Let's talk about the DCEU. DCU. So this from Mashable.com. Zack Snyder's future at Warner Brothers DC Movies. Limited at best. Dunzo at worst. Who uses the word Dunzo? Josh Dickey. The writer of this article is Josh Dickey. He uses the word Dunzo. So, you guys didn't know, Zack Snyder was brought on to kind of helm the DC movies uh, <clears throat> based on his experience with uh, comic book films, his success with 300. And not so much financially with Watchmen, but Watchmen did definitely earn some... Uh, hmm, 
I guess some legs. It's kind of a cult movie now. I mean, a lot of I mean, as far as adaptations go, <clears throat> I personally think that Snyder did that film. And I realize some of you may disagree with me, but Watchmen was supposed to be unfilmable. And Zack Snyder made as faithful a representation, I think, as could have been made. <clears throat> not only that, not only that, but the twist at the end, I thought they tweaked it. Just in case you haven't seen this or read the book, they tweaked the uh, the ending, like the third act reveal uh, for the film. And it, I thought it made a lot more sense. It tied all the characters together. I thought it was really well done. <clears throat> but moving on. So he, he took over. And uh, I remember when he took over and I'd have debates at the local comic shop I had at the time. Um, people were very excited because they loved 300. They loved Watchmen. They loved, uh, you know, I don't think anybody really loved Sucker Punch. But I was con- I was like this. I, de- I didn't like it. I was arguing with them. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I was arguing with them because I felt that um, while Snyder was was and is a great filmmaker, I did not think that he had the right vision for something like Superman. Because every one of his films had this dark tone, had this cynical tone to it. I mean, it basically be like, let's let's make uh, Superman, let's let David Fincher direct it. You know, you don't, it's the, the, the sensibilities clash. What the person brings to the table and what the project needs are different. So... Uh, fast forward a few years, and there's a lot of complaining about uh, the dark direction and the muddle-headedness of the DC properties film-wise. And here, you, here we are. And like I said, I wish Zack Snyder the best. I think he's a talented filmmaker, and my heart breaks for the tra- tragedy that he's endured this year. Um, so this is not on him personally and professionally. I hope he does really well uh, both ways. But this is in regard to his work with the DC films. And there's a lot of DC films that I feel like Zack, that Zack Snyder will be really, really good for. Um, Dark Tone obviously works a lot better with Batman. And I'm going to put this up in the air, and I want to see who agrees with me. Zack Snyder, directing Lobo with concept art by Simon Bisley. I mean, can you, can you envision that film? Boy. See, I think he'd be good for stuff like that. I mean, there's a ton of things that he could do well. Um... Let's get into the article here. Article states, Zack Snyder, primary engineer of the DC Comics movie universe since Man of Steel, whose creative vision has been polarizing to say the least, will take a significantly smaller role with the franchise going forward, as will his wife, producer Deborah Snyder, Mashable has learned. The Snyders left Justice League as director and producer in May, saying they needed time to grieve for their 20-year-old daughter who had died by suicide two months before. Multiple sources with knowledge of Warner Brothers' plans say that as the DC Extended Universe moves forward, the Snyders will no longer have anything like the level of creative influence that got the franchise to this point. <clears throat> For its part, Warner strongly de- denied the notion that the Snyders would no longer be actively involved in creative decision-making. Toby Emmerich, Warner Brothers Picture Group President and Chief Content Officer, said in a statement that the Snyders would maintain a role. The Snyders remain an important part of the Warner Brothers family and are actively involved in several upcoming DC pictures, including their continued creative input on Justice League. We are excited about our partnership and look forward to our continued collaboration. That is intentionally vague. Like I said, you have politicians and then you have Hollywood executives. It's just like the same type of doublespeak. So, uh, indeed, Zack and... Zack and Deborah will be getting respective directing and producing credits on Justice League. They oversaw the bulk of, produ- uh, bulk of production, after all. And it's still possible that they'll carry executive producer or other types of credits for future DC films. But that involvement will be at a distance, multiple sources say. And for the time being, the two are spending time with family while figuring out their next move, which is understood to include Warner Brothers films not within the DCEU. While the Snyder's phasing out may not c- come entirely as a surprise it's sure to send a shockwave through dc fandom and eh, i don't think so i think that's overspeak which fiercely supported snyder's films in the face of harsh critical reception and struggles with the snyder's were not entirely due to the increasingly hostile uh, critical reactions to their films batman v superman and suicide squad in particular warner brothers brass was becoming increasingly concerned with their tendency to drive up budgets uh-huh he does do that really really badly 
and have been anxious for a fresh and creative direction that manifested in Wonder Woman, on which the Snyders were producers. And I could definitely see that in Wonder Woman's look. Uh, Zack Snyder has been, uh, I mean the look of the film, not the character's look, but... Zack Snyder has been heavily involved in all of uh, DC movies to date. He directed Man of Steel and Batman v Superman and was an executive producer on Suicide Squad. And future films like Aquaman, Suicide Squad 2, and The Flash, Flashpoint, there's something we haven't talked about yet that we need to talk about, still carry his name in producing roles. Uh, His creative imprint, a dark metallic visual style and grim, brooding, muscular, emo sensibility, were all over the DCEU and will surely linger into future films. But the post- uh, Post Snyder's regime is wildly expected to make the films in a more hopeful, colorful, comic book inflected direction, like what we saw work so well with Wonder Woman. Yes, it's all about who you get to helm it. I mean, it's, the, the creatives can, uh, the matching sensibilities cannot be overstated, as, and, and the importance of them. At the forefront of that effort is Jeff Johns, who swiftly ascended from the comic book world to become president and chief creative officer at Warner's DC division last year, reporting to Diane Nelson, president of DC Entertainment. His close creative partner and secret weapon will be Joss Whedon, who stepped in for the departing Snyders to finish Justice League. As Variety first reported on Monday, extensive reshoots are underway on that film and more than the usual regularly scheduled pickup shots. Which, if you remember, was what they were reporting is all it was. It's just a couple of little scenes here and there. It's nothing big. Don't worry. Shh, shh. Don't ask questions. Sources confirm that while Snyder's action sequences are usable, a wide swath of story and dialogue are being redone. So, guys, Justice League is Rogue One all over again. <clears throat> Whedon also has Batgirl on the DC slate which is expected to proceed on schedule, but Whedon, who never quite got the credit he deserved as a key architect of Marvel's cinematic universe alongside Kevin Feige after Avengers Age of Ultron, will be a major part of WB's creative team in the future. To some, the same can possibly be said for Aquaman director James Wan and Matt Reeves, the War of the Planet of the Apes director who is taking over the directing chair from Ben Affleck on the planned Batman movie. It's early yet, but Reeves' reputation after Apes could be... Uh, Could not be more sterling. His world-building chops are clearly first-rate, and the studio will throw its support to him. Yes, he was a good choice. Another person whose involvement is now in question, David Ayer, the Suicide Squad helmer, who is still listed as the director of the Harley Quinn-led spinoff Gotham City Sirens, which I still can't figure out if anyone is excited for. I'm not. I I don't like David Ayer. I just don't. I don't like his work. That film was not featured in Warner Brothers' Comic-Con sizzle reel of nine upcoming DC movies last weekend, and sources say Ayers won't ultimately be part of their plans. Ayers rep flatly denied that he's off the project, saying it's still in development and that the script is not yet complete. Hopefully they're still putting their toe in the water to see if anybody actually wants to see it. Uh, we, I'm going to do a video soon of The Glut and how I think this is not boding well for comic book film, the comic book film industry. <clears throat> but getting to it. But there are other signs that he's moving on. Ayer seemed to be signaling his discontent with fans. Uh, I'm sorry, discontent with his WBDC experience at his Comic-Con panel on Thursday for Bright, the fantasy buddy cop film that Netflix gave him $90 million to make. The Alien Nation remake. <laughs> I don't think people realize the situation filmmakers face, he said, stressing that Netflix didn't intervene in this process. They just let him run with it. Bright isn't like some bullshit standard issue studio PG-13 movie. I was able to do some real shit here, said Ayers, who, he's so street. Oh, Ayer, you're so street. Who has directed exactly one PG-13 movie in his career, Suicide Squad. Now, in all fairness, Ayer could very well have been talking about any PG-13 film or what any filmmakers go through Dealing with a studio demanding a PG-13 movie. The director of the RoboCop remake, he could have been referencing that guy. He wasn't necessarily referencing himself. And uh, note that he has, he put like a Harley Quinn thing on his Twitter account, kind of hinting cryptically that maybe he's still on it. So, I don't know. You know, I'm I'm not going to make up stuff about David Ayer. I don't like his movies. I don't like his, his style. 
But, you know, I'm not going to dog the guy. You know, Suicide Squad did very well, even though I thought it was a hot mess. It was enjoyable. I just, meh. Patty Jenkins, on the other hand, is definitely in the Insiders Club, as if there will be any doubt of that, given that Wonder Woman is now the DCEU's most successful film. At the very first, oh, which I predicted it very well might be in my trailer talk review way back in the day. So wrapping up on the Snyders, um, it says the Snyders are certainly not without their fans. Obviously, they're very good. Their exit will be a particular blow to the faction of DC Comics fandom that supported them fiercely, loyally, and vocally against critics. And that includes the people they've worked with. One of them, Ray Fisher, who plays Cyborg in Justice League, wore an I Heart ZS for Zack Snyder. A t-shirt to the film's panel at Comic-Con, which Zack Snyder, who was always at Comic-Con championing his films, did not attend. It was perhaps well known to Fisher, a final Comic-Con tribute at the end of that era, <clears throat> end of an era that has defined modern superhero movies, like it or not. Okay, so my take on this. Here's the minus word. My take on this. I don't think so. I really don't. I think that um, many people appreciate what Zack Snyder has done, but a lot of the support that I've seen um, isn't so much for Snyder as it is DC guys versus Marvel guys. No, uh it's good. No, uh it's good. You know, because the overspeak, the overspeak is so thick over uh, Batman v Superman. I mean, the number of times I've seen it called a masterpiece, and Zack Snyder is a god. I'm like, no, to neither. I'm sorry. You know, it, it's 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 subjective. You can think that way. That's fine, but I don't buy it. I don't buy all the overspeak. And you know, because people don't really, when they overspeak, it's because they don't really mean what they say. They don't really have confidence in it. And, you know, <clears throat> I don't mind flawed films. I, en- I mean, I enjoyed, I enjoyed Batman v Superman. I, ha- I own a copy of it. I mean, I got the extended cut, and it was a much better film. If you've not seen the extended cut, it is a much better film. Uh, it makes a lot more sense. But they just try to throw too much into it. They really did, and I, I understand the temptation. I understand them falling for that. But if Justice League was such a great movie, you would not be spending upwards of I bet twenty-five to fifty million dollars reshooting the damn thing. I it just, and I love Snyder. I mean, this like I said, there's not a diss against Snyder, but this overspeak that's out there is just killing me. I don't know. We'll see. I, I feel like I want to talk about that a little bit later because I feel like Justice League is in a Rogue One situation where they're they're probably re- refilming at least a third of it, and I have a bad feeling that while Warner is wanting to get that Rogue One perfection, which Disney got very lucky and they 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 nailed it out, um, I don't feel like Justice League is going to hit it. I, I don't, I'm not saying it's going to be bad. But I feel like Justice League is probably going to be uh, Suicide Squad all over the place. Hopefully I'm wrong. Post your comments down below. Let me know what you think on this. Um, are we going, is, is Justice League going to be a mess? Is Joss Whedon going to clean it up? Zack Snyder and Joss Whedon are both extraordinarily talented people. They're really good filmmakers. They're, and, and I think that, um, I don't think that any movie with the two of them on it is going to be a bomb. <clears throat> at least as far as the watching experience goes. Now, the level of money they've probably spent on this thing, it will be lucky. Warner Brothers will be lucky if they make a dime on this movie at this point. And I'm not kidding. Uh, we can, we'll can. we get into box office stuff later, but just remember um, the budget for this film that Snyder probably spent was already probably at the $250 million, $300, $300 million mark. So they are going to be pumping in another $50 million or so and then the marketing for this film, I mean, it's, I'm going to guesstimate, and I'll leave it here, but I'm going to guesstimate that they will have to make approximately $1 to $1.1 billion to break even. To break even. Now, that may be a little high. I may find out, I may find out that I am wrong in the numbers, but I don't think I am. They easily spent that much for Batman v Superman, and this is a bigger film. I just... Warner's is going to have to, um, they're going to have to change the game a little bit, start making money on these films. But anyway, guys, that is the podcast for the day. My longest ever. I am celebrating the 300 subscribers that we are now strong at. 
uh, with a full blown hour long podcast. I hope was this too long for the for the two of you that are still with me and the crickets that are in the corner that have died. Is this too long a podcast? Do we prefer uh, more bite? I, I I will be putting this out in bite sized chunks uh, for those who don't have the attention span or the time you know to listen to all of it at once just to make it easier and uh you know some people like certain topics but not others so i like to separate it out you know let me know what you think do you like these do you like listening to podcasts that are longer um do you like the shorter tidbits i mean which way do you want us to go if you got any thoughts please feel free to post them in the comment section down below and as always remember to um you know, look in the description if you ever want to reference articles. If I've forgotten to put the links, you know, you're welcome to comment and say, hey, links, yo. And uh, I'll put the links in there with an apology. And, uh, yeah, your thoughts are welcome always. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. If you're new here, please do subscribe. Hit the notification bell um, and hit that thumbs up if you don't mind because it all helps support my channel. And, uh, I, once again, thank you for being here with me. And I will see you guys on the next one.